Good morning, family. Our scripture this morning comes from the gospel according to John, chapter 13, just two verses, verses 34 and 35, and it reads as follows. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. The instructions of a dying God. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, our creator, bring our minds back from the many scattered places that we find ourselves. That in this moment we may literally breathe in more love and trust that what we need you are granting in this moment. That what we need both individually and collectively as your body, that we are receiving it. So I tune our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. That we may not just be people who believe, but we are people who act on our faith. May it be so, in Jesus' name, amen. So November 1st, tomorrow, is the day on the Christian calendar when we honor the saints of the church throughout history. So it is All Saints Day. This is um, considered All Saints Sunday. Um, but more specifically, it is a day of honoring the martyrs of the church, those who literally died for the gospel, or in the case of our savior, the greatest martyr of all who died for the sake of our lives. In fact, I don't know that we speak or spend enough time talking about how much this natural world operates in a way that allows death to bring forth new life, but that will have to be uh, another sermon for another day. But today is also the last Sunday in October, which is the month we highlight the pain and the injustice of intimate partner violence, which has disproportionately um, higher rates in communities of color and in the black community in particular. More than four out of 10 black women experience intimate partner violence and an estimated 20% or more of black women are raped in their lifetime. We to include transgender black women experience disproportionately more violence, not just at home, but at school, on our jobs, in our neighborhoods, and in the wider society. So amid the many dead and dying places of our lives, the places that allow such violence to continue, but also amid the memory of the saints in our lives that the world will never know as well as the saint of our savior. Let's take a look at the passage that chronicles some of the last conversations Jesus had with his disciples just before his death. Let's see what these words may offer to us today. It was April 2006 and I had just turned off Hillsborough Street here in Raleigh where I live, when my cell phone rang. On the other end was my father calling to tell me that my grandmother who had as a third parent come to live in our home with us when I was born, that she had collapsed. He and my mother and nearly half of my family were on their way to Danville, Virginia when the ambulance was taking her to the hospital. And once the call disconnected, I knew, I knew it was her time to transition, but I prayed wholeheartedly, God, just let me talk to her just one more time. Let me, let me speak to her just one more time. But it wasn't to be so because it was her time. April 2007, I was in my then dimly lit bedroom in 1308, Folsom Lane, Morrisville, North Carolina, when my cell phone rang. It was my mom and she says, your cousin 
Ernest, my grandmother's oldest grandchild, was in a bad car accident this evening and he did not survive. Another soul had transitioned as the heaviness of grief settled over my family once again. April 2008. I was in my car at the drive through of Hardee's in Nightdale, North Carolina, buying breakfast when I received word that my Uncle Larry, grandmother's youngest child, had been taken to the Durham Regional Hospital the night before. My first thought was to go see him after work, but by the time I made it to the chapel at Shaw University where I was working, I knew I needed to go immediately. And I cried all the way to the hospital. This time, my family received calls from me. May 2012, I had been out of town all week for school, working on my doctoral work. I returned on a Friday night and my husband and I were on our way that Saturday to a wedding I had to officiate when his phone rang. It was my sister calling to say that dad had just crossed over that river he often sung about when I was growing up. The old James Cleveland song said, I stood on the banks of Jordan one day to see the ships go sailing by. My mama's over there and my daddy's over there. But all I could do was stand on the banks of the Jordan and see the ships go by. All in all, my family walked through the valley of the shadow of death eight times in the span of seven years. And every time, every single time, I desperately sought to reclaim the last conversation I had with each of my loved ones. I tried to recall what they said, what um, they did, and the significance of it in order to honor their life and love for me. You listen differently. When someone prefaces their sentence with when I die or after I'm gone, death has a way of pushing to the forefront the issues of greatest importance. The psalmist has it right in describing death as a shadow. It is a shadow I believe people feel days, weeks, and sometimes a sense um, is even years before their transition. In some religious cultures, the 31st of October is believed to be a time when the boundary between the material and the spiritual world is blurred. Or as a clergy friend of mine, Reverend Angela would say, it's a thin place. I'm suggesting that there are perhaps many thin places or even moments in our lives that we might be especially sensitive to, but particularly sensitive to them as death draws near. My auntie recalls the weeks before my uncle's transition being filled with his urgency to complete tasks around the house that he had not gotten to. My mom recalled my dad telling her after they married that he didn't think he would live past 40 years. At the time, they both thought that meant his 40th year of life, but in actuality, he transitioned a few months shy of their 40th wedding anniversary. But this shift or sense also often takes place in those who are close to them as well. After conversations with several women of my family, I discovered that in the week leading up to my grandmother's death, we all experience moments of extreme melancholy, crying often and feeling at a loss without understanding or having a reason as to why. I once read an article about a cat who was the resident pet at a rest home and he had an uncanny ability to sense when a resident was about to transition. He would go to their room several days before and remain there for the duration. Our connections to one another and creation are much stronger than we realize. The mood of one person, y'all know this, the mood of one person can change the dynamics in any given space for better or for worse. One person's actions can change the lives of many causing pain and loss or healing and transformation. 
A leader's decision to go to war can begin a pattern of abuse in families and soldiers for generations to come, just as a leader's decision to pursue justice and peace can begin the healing process after centuries of brokenness. A couple of years ago, a young Texas police officer's decision to power trip and abuse authority cost a young NFL player his last precious moments with his dying mother-in-law. But that young NFL player's public acceptance of the officer's apology and refusal to demand what punishment he should receive was the first lesson of grace for some young boy aspiring to play football. Several years ago, the parents of a brain dead newborn surviving only by respirator made a painful decision to release her so that a newborn infant in the same hospital might have the opportunity through a heart transplant to do what their daughter could not live a healthy life. I am not sure family. We respect the power God has given us through connection to one another and creation. And all of these examples <laughs> were about strangers. Now imagine how much power increases among those we are closest to. For intentional love is the most powerful connection in existence. And for all their faults, all their faults, I believe the disciples loved Jesus. For as much as they had struggled to get the discipleship thing right, I believe they knew Jesus to be God. No, it is definitely safe to say that at the Passover meal, they didn't fully grasp the essence of the fully human and fully divine Savior. But you know what? Neither do we. But they had left their families, their careers, their lives in order to follow him. They had seen him perform miracles, control nature, and raise the dead. They had depended upon him and were with him day in and day out. He was their family and yes, he was their God. He was their security and assurance that everything was going to be all right. There was an extraordinary connection among them by virtue of the time they had spent together. And on the eve before his death, they had gathered to celebrate the Passover meal, the last supper. They ate and drank the body and blood of the new covenant. They argued over who would be the greatest and received a lesson in humility. They talked about um, all kinds of things, but Jesus talked about betrayal and they were saddened. Jesus washed their feet and they were grieved by his actions. Jesus had been talking or alluding to his need to depart from them for quite some time. But here, over this meal, I can't help but to believe in the knowing of his coming death, Jesus was different. He was shadowed by the cloud of the suffering descending upon him ever so swiftly. I can't help but to believe that talk of his death, um, his talk of going where they could not follow, and the change in his presence had sparked an uneasiness in the hearts, the spirits of the disciples, a nervous energy cast by fear and uncertainty brought a heaviness to the air, making it hard for the disciples to think and listen as Jesus spoke at length to them. They could feel the change. Thomas asked, how will we know the way if you leave Jesus? Others desperately trying to piece together what Christ was saying to them, not wanting to believe the reality before them. They wanted him to speak plainly and to reassure them in the midst of so much heavy uncertainty. And so I'm not sure they could sift through the myriad of emotions in order to hear the and comprehend the essential instructions Jesus made clear on the eve of his death. Who knows? Maybe that's why Jesus had to return to them several times after his resurrection, but before his ascension to the Father. But nevertheless, instructions of the highest importance were spoken on that night. And even now, those instructions hold more weight than the dying wishes of anyone else we will ever know. 
if you just permit me just a few moments, just a few moments to, to really paint a picture for us so that, so that when we examine these words, we have a, a better grasp of just how important these words were. So just give me a moment. The known universe has 200 to 300 billion galaxies. A galaxy is a large system of stars held together by mutual gravitation and it's isolated from similar systems by vast regions of space. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, holds approximately 200 billion stars and is 100,000 light years in diameter. You all, one light year is just under six trillion miles, just under six trillion miles. And our galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter. There are five arms of the Milky Way and we are on the Orion arm. It takes the Milky Way 240 million years to rotate once clockwise even though the arm we are in is whipping around its center at 465,000 miles per hour. If we were to be able to move at that speed, we would only need half an hour to get to the moon. You all, we are like specks of dust in a limitless universe. The God who hold out of nothingness the birth canal of stars called nebulae, who sculpted beauty out of gas in space, the God who sees the exploding combustion of a dying star and allows that death to nurture the birth of a brand new one, the God that took the desolate darkness of void and sprinkled it with the effervescence brilliance of colors and space and shapes that God became like a speck of dust in the limitless universe he created. That God became human, yielding to humility and obedience to the Father. God became human. This is much more dramatic than the vastest ocean becoming a single grain of sand or the complexities of a musical masterpiece being confined to the dull home of a single flat note. The God who apart from that God's love, we would cease to exist. That God became human. And at the moment in question, that God knew he was going to die. I think it is reasonable to say that we should at least tremble at the thought of ignoring these words that Jesus spoke just before his death. They are words that we should recite every day of our limited existence, who he is coupled with the circumstances under which he spoke them gave them the utmost importance. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if, if you have love for one another. A new commandment I give you, that you be patient and kind with one another, that you won't be envious or arrogant or rude towards each other, but strive for humility. Don't insist with each other that it be your way or no way. Don't allow issues to breed resentment or irritation among you. But neither should you rejoice in wrongdoing, but hold each other accountable in truth. Be willing, be willing to bear one another's burdens and believe when others cannot. Hope for better days with each other and be willing to endure suffering and yes, maybe even death for the sake of your sibling, your sister, or your brother, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus wanted his disciples to respect the power of their connection with loving intention. 
The reason we have laws, ethics, morals is because humanity quickly learned the power each person has in impacting the lives of others. Jesus was saying the way you model and use this power with loving intention is what will distinguish you as my disciples. This was the new commandment Jesus gave on the eve of his death. Now, God clearly says to his disciples what loving him looks like. In John 14, 15, Jesus says to them, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. And the greatest commandment is to what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. All others hang upon these. The new commandment is to love one another. This new commandment is not about loving a stranger. Jesus already commanded that. This is not about um, loving just anybody. This is about the inner circle, our connection to each other in this space. This is about Christ's body. This is about people who profess to be disciples. This is about intimate community. But let's be honest. Intimacy is not developed simply by sitting in the same space with someone for worship each week or watching as we do virtually. Intimacy comes when we are intentional about growing together, building relationships, hearing each other's stories, praying together, even struggling together. Love is an emotional experience, but it's also a choice. And it is at its core that love manifests in our actions. Love and like are not the same things. Jesus commands us to love our enemies, though I doubt we will ever like them. However, because love transcends our feelings in many cases, we will find that actively loving those we don't really get or understand or like, um, that it has the capacity to break a barrier that has kept us from knowing who that person really is. But why is this love so important? Is there more here than we have considered. Well, while preparing for this sermon, I was reminded of what we are taught in community organizing and justice work, that in order to fight oppressive systems and win, we must know each other well enough to trust that we are on the same side, to trust that if we agree to tackle an issue in your community this year, that next year we will tackle one impacting mine. It is built on relational power versus dominant power. Consider this. In Matthew 25, Jesus lays out the difference between sheep and goats. His true disciples versus those who truly or who only just kind of like give lip service. Jesus says that those struggling in systemic poverty without food and clothing, the greatest number of whom are black and brown, women and children, those who are sick, denied access to health care and treatment, those in prison and in our country subjected to legal slavery based more on right race than on crime. And those considered strangers being stripped of their humanity by the term um, illegal alien crossing an imaginary border created in order to oppress and dominate, being detained at times in ways that really take away and strip their humanity, being separated from parents, women and children still being assaulted by those who should be protecting. Jesus says, those who follow me will see that Jesus is the marginalized of the world, born as we've always shared of a single brown teenage mother on the barn ground of a barn. Jesus growing up in Nazareth. Jesus as a toddler fleeing to Egypt as a refugee. So when Jesus says, what you do to the least of these you've done to me, he means it literally, not figuratively. Jesus, we must always remind ourselves and remember what's from the margins. 
And the same word translated in the New Testament as righteousness is also translated in other places as justice. If God is righteous, then God is also just. Jesus' disciples will find ways then to grant access or justice to those whom the world uses and abuses and then demonizes. But then Matthew 28 comes and Jesus issues a commission. Jesus says that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. This is about power, y'all. When Jesus says go, therefore meaning because I have authority that holds every human being without exception as sacred, right? So when Jesus says, go and make disciples, have authority to make disciples of nations, baptizing them under a new th authority in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. We are talking now about systems of people, baptizing them without exception, because all human life is sacred. Every human as worthy of love, regardless of race, religion, age, gender, sexual orientation, or social status. How will the world be able to trust that you are my disciples? How can we distinguish ourselves from the world? How do they know that we are followers of Christ if we have love for one another in the way that Christ has loved us without exception? We change the world with radical love. We honor the saints with radical love. Baptism is not about control or indoctrination, nor is it about us versus them, but it is about a commitment to love and a commitment to the truth that we are all created in the image of God without exception. It is a call to model the power under which we live. What if we missed something along the way? Well, now is the time to hear what Jesus is saying to us. It's a lot easier to hold on to hope when you're in a community who takes seriously its call to hope. For love hopes all things. Loving one another as Jesus has loved us is a major implication of what we can accomplish in this world. Jesus says to his followers, this is how all will know that you are my disciples. At the very least, Jesus wanted to mark his claim upon his own. He wanted it clearly marked that they were his, even though he knew that all of his disciples would deny him before he died. He still wanted all the world to know that they were connected to him. It is unbelievable that though in size we are no more than a speck of dust in a limitless universe, that the God that carved every minuscule detail of this existence that we know wants to be loved by us, wants to be claimed by us as he claims us. The question is, do we want to love him? Do we want to be marked as he is for all the world to see? In an interview with a New Orleans resident after Hurricane Katrina, a reporter asked um, a woman and was taken off guard, but was asking her, what the devastation of the area churches um, was meaning for the people and how it was affecting the people. And the woman's reply was something akin to, what churches? We don't go to churches. We get our chicken at Popeye's. What does it say about us that at least for this woman during one of the most devastating moments in the life of her city, her first thought upon hearing the word church wasn't the loving community of Christ's disciples, wasn't the justice-oriented um, life and community of Christ's disciples wasn't the space that loved all people and loved one another in a way that was distinguishable, but was of the restaurant that serves chicken. 
Do we want to love him? Do we want to be marked as he is for all the world to see? The answer to that question is not found in whether or not we can quote scriptures just right or whether or not we can be exactly right in all things. But it is found and determined in whether or not we heed the instructions of this our dying God. Can we love one another as Christ loved us? In Jesus' name, God grant us a capacity. <laughs>